Rising to popularity in mixed martial arts is such a long shot. Not only do you have to win fights against people who are trained to beat you into oblivion, but you also have to cater to the winds of promoters, pundits, and well, a rather infamously fickle fan base. Of course, we're not talking about you watching. No way. <laughs> you're all clearly very well balanced, educated scholars of the sport. Uh, just kidding, you're all evil. That balancing act between performing on fight night and showing the right amount of the right aspects of the right personality at the right time is treacherous enough to navigate, and just one move can wash all of that hard work down the drain. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and here are 10 moments that turn fans against popular fighters. Really quick disclaimer here, I'm not personally endorsing any of these fan sentiments. I in fact disagree with a lot of them, just merely presenting the overall fan reaction of the time. That doesn't include many of you, of course, watching this video. It's just a large enough contingent of the fans that turn their back on the fighters that we are presenting. If you disagreed with those fans, great, I likely did too. So now that I've stroked your ego as well as mine, let's continue continue on, shall we? Number 10. Carlos Condit versus Nick Diaz Imagine having 28 wins on your record with 26 of them being finishes and being labeled a boring fighter? That's the exact bizarre predicament that Carlos Condit found himself in after defeating Nick Diaz for the interim welterweight title at UFC 143. Much to the dismay of the crowd at the MGM Grand Arena and fans around the world, the natural born killer and 209's favorite son did not engage in an all-out firefight like they expected. Under the guidance of coaches Greg Jackson and Mike Winklejohn, Condit elected to avoid Diaz's signature aggressive style by using defensive footwork and careful shot selection. Imagine that, instead of sticking his chin out and throwing caution to the wind, Condit decided to focus on a particular facet of Diaz's game. And while the decision is considered by some to be a robbery, the differential and significant strikes landed says otherwise. Just look at the stats yourself. Even though Diaz waited until the final round to adjust his approach, Condit shouldered a large part of the blow from the fan base, especially the hardcore Diaz army. Comment sections on articles and videos about the fight turned into a powder keg of anger, with his 96% finishing rate being ignored in favor of accusations of being scared homie and running away from a real fight. Number 9. Brock post UFC 100 Okay, before you get too up in arms about this one, I realize he's never really been that popular with hardcore fans. But on one hand, there were the mass amount of new fans who followed the pro wrestling superstar into his latest athletic adventure. On the other hand, of course, were the purists, who were questioning why someone known largely for scripted combat with a 1-0 record was being welcomed into MMA's leading organization. Despite the inherent detractors, Lesnar actually remained rather respectful and was well-liked by enough of the casual audience. He was still getting cheers at that point. Aside from the personal issues with his promotional debut against opponent Frank Mir, the former WWE champion mostly showed humility that betrayed his persona in pro wrestling. Seriously, you should go back and watch some of those post-fight speeches, even the first loss to Frank Mir. But then, by the time their rematch came around at UFC 100, the bad blood he had for his rival came to a head in the main event blockbuster card immediately after Lesnar exacted his revenge by brutal TKO. And one of the most infamous moments in UFC history, so infamous that it's actually been edited out of Fight Pass, Lesnar went on a saliva-spilling rampage screaming at the cameras after taunting his concussed opponent and shoving officials. The booze rained down from the crowd as Rogan started his customary post-fight interview. He would incite more rage after going after Mir and UFC sponsor Bud Light before announcing he'd reconsummate his marriage that night. This turned even his largely casual fan base that was in support of him and turned it into a much smaller, more dedicated fan base of diehards. But it only took a quick public apology to get back in Dana's good graces. Number 8. Anderson Silva, UFC 112 At the height of his powers, Anderson Silva was much like a character in Tekken. <laughs> 90s kids unite. With a beautiful mix of precision striking, submission prowess, and a flair for the dramatic, a Silva fight was simply appointment viewing for many fans. Unfortunately, though, he also also had the occasional tendency to fight at the level of his opposition, as consecutive fights with Patrick Cote and Talos Leitas showed. But his time-bending performance against Forrest Griffin at UFC 101 had everyone buzzing and forgetting about the recent past. But then of course when he was booked against BJJ ace Damian Maia at UFC 112 in front of Zufa's new ownership partners in Abu Dhabi, it was expected to be a showcase of the best that the spider had to offer. Instead, he put on one of the most confusing and frustrating performances
performances ever witnessed, spending most of his time just taunting after showing his clear advantage in the fight. I don't know that anyone seen this fight and considered it a good fight. Especially Dana White who vowed to make it up to the fan somehow and refused to put the belt on him that night. While his skills and dominance were universally lauded, the tolerance for his in-cage antics were wearing thin, paving the way for the support a previously unheralded and rather unknown Chell Sonnen would have when he faced Silva in the next middleweight title fight. And in one of the all-time great fights in MMA history, Silva would be forgiven by the masses with his last-minute win. This actually shows the idiom that you're only as good as your last performance isn't always a bad thing. Number 7. Ioana's Reaction to the Rose Losses One thing that always seems to get a thumbs up from the savages that love combat sports is the ability not just to win, but also handle a loss well. Look no further than Dominic Cruz after losing his belt to Cody Garbrandt, or even Conor McGregor's thoughtful and honest analysis of his loss to Nate Diaz. Joanna Janjacek tried something different though after her stunning knockout loss to Rose Namajunas at UFC 217. While she initially was congratulatory of Rose at the post-fight presser and offered no excuses for the results, the previously undefeated champion would change her tune shortly after. She would go on record to blame her team of nutritionists and pointed to her personal issues that took away from the performance. Joanna would even go as far as to downplay Nami Yunus's rightful claim to the belt by repeatedly saying that she was the real queen of the strawweight division. Similar things were said after her second fight as well, and through it all, many of the people that followed her on her near-historic run as dominant champion were completely turned off by this sudden personality shift from the woman that had endeared herself to the fans to somebody who was just kind of a sore loser. Following her performance against the likes of Wei Li Zhang, though, in recent appearances, it's proven difficult to stay angry at the former champ. Number 6. TJ Dillashaw vs Cejudo and EPO Chances are, if you were part of Team Alpha Male, TJ Dillashaw has been on your shit list for much longer than this entry acknowledges. But for the general public, sides weren't picked in the back and forth jilted ex relationship like trash talk between the former Bantamweight champion and his original training camp. In fact, most people seem to side with Dillashaw, whose partnership with displaced coach Dwayne Ludwig was producing exceptional work inside the cage. The champ even made fun of the criticism he did receive with the snake in the grass moniker, famously given to him by Conor McGregor with a tattoo and branded merchandise to go along with it. But that goodwill started to change ahead of his drop down to flyweight to face Henry Cejudo. With what many believe to be the future of the division at stake, Dillashaw vocalized his desire to close the 125 pound weight class and refer to himself as Dana's hitman. I could care less, man. You know, if the UFC wants me to be an assassin, if they want to hire me to go down there and end it, I'll end it. If they don't cut it, awesome too. I, 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 don't, I don't really care. It's more about myself. For obvious reasons, this did not sit well with many who were campaigning to see the division stay alive. Definitely weird coming from someone that you thought was your friend talking about, can't wait to like have you lose your job and, and take this away, basically. But that nail in the coffin came in the aftermath of Cejudo's sub-minute KO of the Skeletor-like remains of Dillashaw. Not just his reaction to the loss, but also weeks later, he popped for EPO, which if you didn't know, stands for Lance Armstrong. <laughs> The backlash was instant as his entire championship run was after all marked by high volume and cardio intensive strategies. With his two year suspension coming to an end before long, it'll be pretty interesting to see how he carries the scarlet letters EPO. Number 5. Cormier Spoils a Legend At one point in time, DC was one of the UFC's most hated fighters. He won the famous Strike Force Heavyweight Grand Prix, which gave him a terrific start with fans. And before long, he'd also beat out several popular UFC heavyweights and light heavyweights too, en route to challenging John Jones. Even when you look back at that fight, he was still getting cheers from the fans. And after Jones's massive legal issues and a hit and run involving a pregnant woman, he was stripped of his title, and that's when Cormier was again thrusted back into the title picture. And surviving an early scare, the first fight with Anthony Johnson turned into a wrestling clinic, and again, the crowd still had his back, but there was a seed of resentment sown from some of the fans that viewed him as a quote, fake or paper champion. But for the time being, the crowd still openly cheered him. Fast forward though to the fateful UFC 200 performance against Anderson Silva after Jones tested positive just mere days ahead of the event, Cormier avoided a striking battle and wrestled the middleweight goat and the crowd completely turned against him, showering him with booze that night. The growing resenters of him as a fake champion also became extremely 
extremely vocal. And it only got more intense in the second Anthony Johnson fight as he was another great striker controlled on the ground, even though he tried to wrestle DC. But just like that, DC became one of the most disliked fighters on the roster. Yes, he always had fans throughout this, including myself. I mean, after all, he never did anything wrong. But it took until the UFC 214 results came back with Jones testing again for yet another banned substance that Cormier was reawarded with the vacant title and fans finally began appreciating the embattled champion. Couple that with his emerging commentary role that let the fans get to know him on a completely different level, and those days of unpopularity simply became a relic of the past. And naturally, this ties right into our next entry. Number four, John Jones everything? The saga of John Jones is a never-ending story of triumph, failure, redemption, rinse, and repeat. But throughout most of it, Jones somehow maintained good standing with most MMA fans. His initial DUI that led to him wrecking the UFC gifted Bentley was mostly ignored. Good question. Don't wreck the Bentley. <laughs> The accusations of a former mentor and training partner in Rashad Evans of a double life that was the opposite of his devoutly Christian image were largely dismissed. Not by everyone, but by most. A hit and run with a pregnant injured woman? Who cares? Okay, for the hardcore fans, it was definitely the end for many of them. But casual fans were still cheering him over DC at press conferences. Oh yeah, New York. You guys ready to see DC get his ass whooped again? But it was the PED test failure after UFC 214 that finally made many jump off of his bandwagon. After a stunning head kick to reclaim the light heavyweight title he never lost, it appeared that the troubled star was finally putting controversy in the rearview mirror. That was until test results showed the presence of the PED oral Terenabal days later. So after a year and a half of battling with USADA and athletic commissions, Jones was brought into the cage with another asterisk as more questionable drug test results led to UFC 232 moving moving from Las Vegas to Los Angeles in less than a week's time. Where Jones had once heard an overwhelming amount of cheers, it was booze that filled the room during the pre-fight press conference as questions lingered about the sudden change in plans. This has largely remained the same since, but regardless, his sales have still been really high, and a recent tussle with, you guessed it, Dana White over his pay have actually managed to gain more support back, even if only on this one singular issue. Number three, Rousey's bitter attitude. There's no questioning that her rise in MMA was meteoric. As a result of this surging popularity, a new crop of female fans of all ages came out to support, but in particular, young girls were looking to Rousey as a role model and a motivation for beginning their own martial arts journey or whatever it is they were trying to accomplish in life. To have like little girls come up like that and say that I inspire them, I just, I, I was lucky to have my mom, you know, so I never really had that absence of a strong female role model. There was even UFC marketing based on this with the hashtag Rousey Revolution. However, that image would soon begin to unravel as things developed. While turning down a handshake from Misha Tate in an embarrassing stint on Tough certainly raised a few eyebrows and was enough to get a lot of backlash online, it was two years later that would would be the proverbial straw in the camel's back. At the weigh-ins for UFC 193, Rousey would angrily confront her challenger Holly Holm with accusations of being phony. She looked disoriented and drawn out from a tough weight cut. Her profane rambling was a shock to many fans, especially in contrast to the demeanor of Holm who was unaffected by the tirade. Plus, who the fuck would ever use profanity? <laughs> Not me. So when Holm landed the epic head kick that ended Rousey's reign, it was the icing on the cake. But her reaction to the whole thing saw her combative with fans, reporters, and basically blaming everyone except herself and her team, all while holding a better than thou attitude, which has even made its way into her wrestling career. These days, it's difficult to find many in the current fan base that will vouch for her as a result. Number two, Connor's crazed antics. It's hard not to place the highest selling star in the sports history with the top spot here. Seemingly overnight, the plumber's apprentice who was living with his parents became one of the most recognized pro athletes on the planet and out earned all of his colleagues in MMA. With a huge fan base from his homeland of Ireland willing to travel across the Atlantic and a massive following stateside, a McGregor fight has brought tons of people to the UFC. But the trash talk that propelled him to big box office numbers took a turn for the dark side leading up to his fight with Habib Nurmagomedov at UFC 229. While Habib is isn't totally innocent here either. It was Connor's dolly throwing his outlandish behavior online and sound bites that started drawing the ire of even his most stringent supporters. Even a weird feud with the Irish mob and sex scandals wouldn't take him down. But it was an incident at a Dublin pub that not even the most ardent supporters could bring themselves to defend. 
After a brief verbal exchange about Connor's whiskey, which actually is pretty funny that the old man just didn't give a fuck about that drink, the former two division champion punched the 50 year old man in the face. This killed much of his fan support across the world, but even more so in Ireland, where many bars decided to remove Proper 12 from their shelves altogether. As evidenced by UFC 246, a McGregor fight is still very much a big deal. But just like his old opponent Floyd Mayweather, it's not just popularity that means sales. Number 1. Tito Ortiz Refusing to Fight Chuck Liddell It's deceptively easy to forget that with as many Twitter memes and odd moments from the MMA legends, that he was once the sport's most popular star. At a time when the UFC was struggling to stay afloat and fighting for a place in mainstream sports and pop culture, Ortiz was one of the few faces non-fight fans would recognize that brought in a massive amount of new eyeballs to the promotion and sport. But Ortiz drew the ire of faithful followers when he initially refused to fight former training partner and rightful contender Chuck Liddell. And partially fueled by Dana White taking Chuck's side, the backlash was pretty huge. The Huntington Beach bad boy who had carried so much favor with the fans and promotion was steadily losing traction as Liddell remained actively fighting and repeatedly proving his number one contendership. Between contract disputes and suspicious timing, it looked like the day would never come for the two to meet in the octagon, opting instead to face a past his prime Ken Shamrock, and then sitting on the shelf forcing the Liddell Couture fight and then being ready to defend his belt again, but Couture's upset victory earning Ortiz the side eye of many fans. Since then, his image has never really recovered. Between fumbled trash talk, incoherent beefs, and that weird revenge trilogy KO over Chuck in 2018, where he celebrated as if he'd just beaten a prime man who was not coming off an eight-year retirement, the sad side of it all is perhaps the latest image unsettlingly burned into the mind of fans. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Anthony Walker for writing this list. Be sure to support the Walk of Shame on his Twitter account, at AntWalkerMMA. And then the video editor of this list is a man you know well, MJ. You can follow him on Twitter at TomMJMoore. Thanks for watching my list, guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA, and it really helps us out when you do so. If I missed anything on this vid, let me know in the comments, and feel free to follow me on Twitter, at JasonTheHeart, or follow the official channel account, at OnPointMMA. Thanks for watching so much, and I'll catch you on the next video.